Hello and welcome to Biographics. I'm your interim and slightly less aerodynamic host, Carl Smallwood, and today we're talking about Bob Marley, the legend of music, written by Radu Alexander. One good thing about music is that when it hits you, you don't feel pain. Those are the immortal words of the legendary Bob Marley, a man who thought that music could bring the world together in peace and unity. And even if you're not a fan of Bob Marley or his music, chances are you like at least one of his songs. Marley took a new and innovative sound that was largely relegated to the dance halls and airways of Jamaica and turned them into something that was not just international, but timeless. Bob Marley was born Robert Nasta Marley on February 6, 1945, in his maternal grandfather's farm in Nine Mile, a district of St. Anne Parish in Jamaica, which was still a British colony at the time. Anyway, his mother was Sadella Malcolm, a local girl who was only 18 when she became pregnant with Bob, his father, a much more enigmatic figure in the area of Jamaica, and was called Norvell Sinclair Marley and was almost 60 years old when he met... Bob Marley's mum. Everybody just called Norville Captain, though it's unclear whether or not it's just a nickname or if he actually served in any sort of military or naval capacity. And if it wasn't already clear from the name Norville, Captain was white, something Bob Marley grew to resent in his later years due to teasing he received from other boys. Shortly after Sadella gave birth to Bob, from that point on, Norville became something of a ephemeral ephemeral? Ephemeral presence in his son's life till he died around 10 years later at age 70, when Bob was only 10 years old. As an adult, Marley didn't have any nice thing to say about his father. In fact, he barely acknowledged his existence at all and kept a single memento of his father's existence. An old photograph of a white man riding a horse. During his childhood, Bob moved around for a bit until 1957 when he and his mother moved from the slums of Kingston into the government yard of Trenchtown where, and I quote, Georgie would make firelights and they would cook cornmeal porridge. Sounds really nice. Cornmeal porridge sounds super nice. I'll have to get me some cornmeal porridge after this. There, Sadella Marley made the acquaintance of a carpenter named Thaddeus Livingston, who already had eight children, including a boy about Bob's age, named Neville, although everyone simply called him Bunny. Yeah, okay. Bunny's a much better name. Pretty quickly, Bob and Bunny became thick as thieves and would while away many an evening, singing and playing on a homemade guitar that Bunny made from an old sardine can. Um, some bamboo for the neck and insulation copper wiring for the strings. He wasn't exactly a Stratocaster, but it got the job done. The late 50s, early 60s were a quintessential time for Jamaica's music scene, as local artists were busy exploring and defining the genres that would go on to become popular the entire world over. Ska, Rocksteady, and of course, the reggae. One of the artists was Joe Higgs, part of a successful duo called, oddly enough, Higgs and Wilson. And he lived in Trenchtown, and his house was often turned into a neighborhood dance hall, where local would-be musicians turned up to show their stuff, as well as study under Higgs's learning tree. While attending one of these open-air music sessions, Bob and Bunny made the acquaintance of another young artist. His name was Winston Hubert McIntosh, although he went by Peter Tosh for obvious reasons. Immediately, he grabbed Marley's attention because he possessed a rare artifact among the poor musicians of Trenchtown, an actual guitar that had not been improvised from scrap parts and sardine cans. The three quickly struck up a fast friendship where they discovered their singing harmonised pretty well together and decided to make some beautiful music. Many others would join them at various points during their career, but the core trio consisted of Marley, Bunny, and Tosh. All they needed now was a name, and at first they went by the Teenagers, because you know, they were, they were teenagers, which they didn't quite like, so they changed that to the Wailing Rude Boys, which they also didn't like, changing it again to the Wailing Wailers, and then finally, and more simply, the Wailers. From the start, it was fairly obvious that Bob Marley was the breakout star of the group. Joe Higgs had taken the teenage musician under his wing, was impressed with Marley's dedication towards improvising and improving upon his craft. In 1962, Bob Marley met with a Jamaican record producer called Leslie Kong and managed to dazzle him by performing on the spot in the middle of his shop without accompaniment. Kong agreed to produce Marley's first single, a song titled Judge Not. It received almost no airtime and made the singer peanuts, but still, he'd released his first record at a tender age of 16. He ended up recording two more songs later that year, One Cup of Coffee and Terror Again, neither of which set the charts on fire, but didn't exactly discourage him from making more music, as you've probably already surmised. I didn't know one of his songs called A Cup of Coffee, I was just very thirsty. Still, if the solo art wasn't working out, maybe he would have had more success with The Wailers. The following year, Marley met another of the leading lights of Jamaica's music scene, record producer Clement Coxon Dodd, where Higgs taught young Bob to embrace his passion for music. Higgs taught him to see what the music industry was really about and how it worked. He also saw promise in The Wailers, so in 1963, he helped produce their first single, Simmer Down. Unlike Marley's previous solo efforts, this was a hit 
at least in Jamaica. And in 1964, he reached the top of the charts in that country. Two more hits followed, It Hurts To Be Alone and Lonesome Feeling. But just because the group was getting popular, it did not exactly translate into any sort of financial bonanza. Quite the opposite in fact, because for the first few years, Marley had been homeless. His mother had married a man named Edward Booker and moved to America, specifically Wilmington, Delaware. I'm in Delaware. Hi, I'm in Delaware. I'm old. Without his mother, Marley couldn't afford a place to sleep, so he spent most nights sleeping in Doctor's Record Studio using an old door propped on cinder blocks. This is one of the most legendary, well-known famous musicians. He slept on a door. Why a door? <sighs> Unfortunately, even back then, the music industry was as predatory as ever, and producers like Dodd kept most of the earnings since they provided the studio and the equipment while musicians only received a pittance. Cause it's not like they were doing anything right, just creating all the music that people like to listen to. I sure am glad we're past that. Since there was always more starving artists out there to exploit, eventually Marley concluded that the only way to make some real money from music was to start his own record company and control the entire production process from start to finish. This, however, also required a large sum of cash to get going, something which Marley obviously didn't have since he spent most nights sleeping on a door he didn't own. In 1965, Bob's mother sent word from America asking him to join her in Delaware. Bob would later note that the offer was extremely tempting, but he just met a girl called Rita Anderson and the two had fallen in love, so he formulated a plan. On February 10th, 1966, Bob and Rita got married. Afterwards, Bob left for America, hoping to save enough money to return to Jamaica and start a record company. Marley resented being just another cog in the machine. Tell me about it. Feeling that everything was, and I quote, too fast, too noisy, too rush rush. Even so, he proved to be a hard worker. For example, he started out as a lab assistant at DuPont Chemical, and then he worked on the assembly line of a Chrysler factory. He also had a night shift at a warehouse and occasionally picked up part-time shifts as a dishwasher and parking lot attendant. However, it wasn't all smooth sailing because Marley frequently got into conflicts and arguments with his mother over religion, a devout Christian woman. Sidella wasn't happy that her son had become a follower of the Rastafarian movement, which also persuaded Marley to grow out his signature dreadlocks. Meanwhile, in Jamaica, the Whalers had continued to create music, substituting Marley with one of Rita's cousins, while Rita herself would perform as part of a female trio called the I-3s. During this time, the Whalers also released an album called The Wailing Whalers. Admittedly, this was just a compilation of earlier stuff they'd done, but still, they had an album. At the time, ska had begun to decline in popularity in favour of the more relaxed and deliberate rhythms of Rocksteady, and reggae. Dodd kept stiffing the Whalers on payments, so the group left him and started their own label in 1967, Whaling Soul Records. I'm gonna bet, I'm not even gonna look at it, I'm gonna bet, I'm gonna bet right now that's not going anymore. But even though the band knew how to make records, they knew diddly squat and how to sell them. Their record label closed by the end of the year, because of course. It's not like they had Bob Marley or anything working with them. Fortunately for them, other offers appeared. The aforementioned producer, Leslie Kong, approached the Whalers wanting to record a new album using that up-and-coming reggae style. And it is, it's really good. I do like reggae. And, you know, contrary to what you see right here, this, like, you know, this alabaster complexion, I do love me some reggae. It's real good. Like, sometimes on evening, you just put some smooth reggae on, you grab a beer, you open the windows, get the breeze going through. Can't beat it. I shot the sheriff. The end result was The Best of the Whalers, which, oddly enough, was not a compilation album, despite the name. Apparently, naming songs and albums was not the forte of the Whalers uh, at that time. But then Kong dropped dead of a sudden heart attack. Oh, I did read ahead, but that, that still got me. So the Whalers were once again looking for a new producer. In 1970, they embarked on a two-year working relationship with Lee Scratch Perry, who produced two albums for the band Soul Rebels and Soul Revolution Part 2. Yeah, that, okay, Soul Revolution Part well, There's no Soul Revolution Part 1. But it was someone else who, for better or worse, would play a vital role in the introduction of the Whalers to the rest of the world. American singer-songwriter Johnny Nash. Not to be confused with Johnny Cash. I know my accent is a bit confusing and I speak too quickly, but let me reiterate, Johnny Nash. <laughs> By the early 1970s, the music coming out of Jamaica had made its way stateside and American artists had started coming to the Caribbean island looking for new sounds and collaborators. And one of them was the aforementioned Johnny Nash, a Houston-born singer who'd been active since the mid-50s, and Nash and his manager, one Danny Sims, um, heard Marley play and approached him with a deal. Basically, Nash wanted to help him get that reggae sound just right, and in exchange, he promised new opportunities on the international stage. A pretty sweet deal! But there was a caveat, as there always is. So Marley agreed and signed with Nash and Sims' record label, Jad Records. His first gig was in Sweden, where he was supposed to help Nash score the soundtrack to a movie that the latter was starring in. Internationally, it was released as Love Is Not A Game, although none of Bob Marley's music made it into the final cut. Still, Sweden. 
pretty cool, right? Bit of Sweden. Bob Marley, like, you know, I, I, I won't be mad. Free trip to Sweden. From Sweden, Marley popped over to London, where he worked with Nash and his band on their new album. Danny Sims, who by this point was basically acting as Marley's manager, sent for the other Whalers. He wanted them on Johnny's album, but lured them to London with a promise of a national tour. Well, as it turned out, the tour mainly consisted of <laughs> secondary school and the occasional club thrown in for good measure. Hey, that means though some, some British school kid out there heard Bob Marley before he was famous. And you know what, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool, right? Marley recorded a solo single during this time, titled Reggae on Broadway, but it flopped harder than a mattress being Sparta kicked into a pool full of mercury. And then one morning, the Whalers woke up in their cold and crappy apartment in Bayswater to discover that Nash and Sims had left England without telling them, trading the overcast skies of London for the sunny skyline of Miami. I hope this gets good for Marley soon, because I'm starting to feel bad for, I know that he was famous and rich and successful, but I'm starting to feel bad for the dude. Penniless and despondent, Marley at least discovered that he was famous, at least in London, and was well known amongst the music scene there, due to the fact Dodd had licensed several of their songs to another label called Island Records. Of course, Marley and the other band members weren't paid for this, and instead were paid in exposure. Yeah. They even got Bob Marley with that. Actually, as it turned out, most places didn't accept exposure, so the Whalers found themselves stranded in London and in desperate need of cash. Using their connections, they eventually secured a face-to-face -face with Chris Blackwell, the founder of Island Records. Blackwell was convinced that a Jamaican act could make it big in London with the right guidance, and he thought that maybe the Whalers could be the act. Specifically, though, he thought that Bob Marley could be the act. As far as Blackwell was concerned, the rest of the band didn't matter. Bob Marley was the star. With that in mind, Blackwell agreed to loan them in advance so they could fly home and record a new album. Now, I've got to and give big props to Bob Marley here. That's a power move, that isn't it? It's like we've been making music in London for the past like year or so, but we need to be in Jamaica. We can't create that reggae sound without being on the island of Jamaica. Now, what a hustle. You go, Bob, you go. Back in warmer and more familiar surroundings, the Whalers got right to work, and after a few weeks, the album was done. Marley flew back to London with the Masters under his supervision. Blackwell works with his own magic, overdoing the tracks to combine the smooth reggae sound with the rock vibe that played well commercially in London at the time. He even got famed session musician Wayne Perkins to play lead guitar on a few tracks to make them more rock and roll. The end result was Catch a Fire, released in 1973 and nowadays considered one of the greatest reggae albums ever made. It didn't exactly sell like gangbusters, but it did do well enough for the Whalers to go on a tour of the UK and the US. During the American tour, the Whalers briefly opened for Sly and the Family Stone, but got fired because the crowd liked them too much, and Sly didn't want to be, and I quote, a warm-up act. Keen to capitalise on their newfound success, the group quickly got to work on another album, which was released later that same year, titled Burning. It was another hit with the critics and included one of Bob Marley's defining songs, I Shot the Sheriff, which was later covered by Eric Clapton. You know, that's not like Eric, stealing a black person's music and making it his own. It seemed that Marley had finally arrived, but after the highs, come the lows. Unfortunately, Blackwell's tendency to focus on Marley didn't sit well with the other two founders, Peter Tosh and Bunny Whaler, who also weren't fans of doing international shows. On a late autumn evening in the tour of England in 1973, tension between Tosh and Marley reached a boiling point. The two went into a bitter shouting match, and they unofficially disbanded at that moment. The Whalers were no more, at least not as we knew them. Bob, like to his credit, did manage to find a completely new lineup, which included his wife and the I3s, and got back to doing what he did best, making sweet, sweet music. The label also started promoting the band as Bob Marley and the Whalers, just in case it wasn't clear who the star was. Now, normally losing the entire lineup for a band would spell doom for their success, but Marley's star was already shining too bright to be dimmed by something as simple as every member of the band leaving at once. In 1974, in October, Bob Marley and the Whalers released their seventh album, Natty Dread. It was once again popular with critics and sold the best out of all their albums so far, especially in the UK. More importantly though, it included Marley's greatest hit, No Woman, No Cry. A year later, the band put out a live album that also performed incredibly well in the charts, and more importantly, included a live version of No Woman, No Cry that went on to become the definitive version of that song. In 1976, Bob Marley released his eighth album, Rasterman Vibrations, which went on to become his breakout hit in the US, and his first one to enter the Billboard Top 10. By that point, Bob Marley had officially arrived, as it were, and his albums were selling well, and concert demands were at an all-time high, and the Rolling Stone magazine just proclaimed the Whalers the band of the year. Nobody could deny that Bob Marley was the most popular reggae artist in the world, or even that he was the most beloved figure in all of Jamaica at that time. So when Jamaican Prime Minister Michael Manley wanted to throw a concert to ease the rising political tensions, Marley seemed like the obvious choice 
for a headliner. The concert was known simply as Smile Jamaica, and it came at a time when the two main political factions in the country, the Social Democratic People's National Party, or PNP, and the Conservative Jamaican Labour Party, or JLP, were engaged in a conflict that was starting to turn violent. Many felt that the country was a powder keg waiting to explode, and there was a lot of pressure for the concert to go smoothly. Up until this point, Marley had always remained fairly apolitical, saying, and I quote, Rasta, no go left, no go right. Rasta, go straight ahead. Yes. Can you tell? I took acting classes in college. However, since the Jamaican Ministry of Culture was sponsoring the event, a lot of people saw it as a tacit endorsement of the ruling political party, the PNP, on behalf of Bob Marley. And to make matters worse, the Prime Minister pulled off a real sneaky move by calling for a snap election on December 15th, 1976, 10 days after the show, effectively turning Smile Jamaica into a benefit concert for the party. Marley was reportedly furious with Manley, as he was promised that it would be, and I quote, just music, no politics. But you know the golden rule? The show must go on. Plus, Bob didn't want to hurt the people of Jamaica over the devious actions of a few politicians who were looking to use him to score some extra points in the polls. However, by agreeing to go through the concert, Marley unwittingly put himself into the crosshairs of some dangerous people who really, really didn't want him to take the stage. It was December 3rd, just two days before the concert, when Marley and the Whalers had been rehearsing at his home on 56 Hope Road. They were in the kitchen taking a well-earned break when two white Datsuns filled with six or seven gunmen reports aren't really clear, um, pulled up outside his driveway and made their way towards the house. They surround the building and open fire with automatic weaponry. Fortunately, even though some of them were armed with automatic rifles, they displayed a, let's say, stormtrooper level of accuracy that miraculously resulted in zero fatalities. Marley's wife Rita was actually shot in the head while trying to exit the house, and even though like, the bullet grazed her head and she was knocked out, she recovered with no real injury. A family friend named Lewis Griffith took one to the gut and Marley himself caught a bullet that scratched his chest before embedding itself in his arm. Chest into the arm. However, it was Marley's manager, Don Taylor, who got it worse. He was shot five times. He was rushed to the hospital and despite being shot, remember, five different times, he survived the ordeal without any serious injury. But worst of all was Marley's manager, Don Taylor, who was shot five times. But after being rushed to hospital for emergency surgery, he too recovered from the ordeal with no lasting injuries. It's never been definitively established who was behind the hit. Most assume it was the JLP because, come on, pretty obvious, right? However, no arrests were made in the case. And despite his injury, Marley elected to go through with the concert. As he got on stage in front of an exhilarated, massive crowd of both PMP and JLP supporters, Marley said he would sing one song because he couldn't strum his guitar, you know, due to bullet wounds. He would go on to play for 90 straight minutes, turning the concert into the symbol of peace and unity it had always been intended to be. Following the concert, Marley went to recuperate in the Bahamas for a month, but afterwards decided not to return to Jamaica, but instead to travel to England in a, and I quote, self-imposed exile. And ordinarily I'd be annoyed at someone like, you know, using England as like the punchline of a joke, but given what England looks like 90% of the time, like all grey, dreary and wet, as you can probably tell from my head, I'm literally recording this after getting in from my morning jog, during which just the skies opened, I I'll let Marley off for this one. So like, during that time, he spent about two years recording two new albums, Exodus and Kaya. Both were well received, especially Exodus, which many consider Marley's finest and best studio album, and contains the eponymous hit single, as well as classics such as Jammin', One Love, and Three Little Birds. And I would be remiss if I did not say right now my father's favourite Bob Marley joke. How does Bob Marley like his donuts? With Jammin'! <laughs> Look forward to jokes like that for many more videos to come. When it came time for Marley to make his return to Jamaica, he did it for another show intended to quell the political civil war that was still brewing in the country. This was the One Love Peace concert held on April 22nd, 1978, and it left behind a powerful, long-lasting image when Marley invited on stage the two political leaders, Michael Manley, who we've already mentioned, and Edward Sager, and they all held up their hands together in a show of peace and unity. It didn't last or really work. Political violence in Jamaica continued, but hey, it was worth a shot. Unfortunately, just as Marley's international career was really taking off, he was hit by serious health problems. While on the European tour for Exodus, Bob hurt his right foot during a football game in Paris. And since the article doesn't clarify whether this was football as I'd understand it as a British person, or football as an American would understand it, I'm gonna have to just assume it was soccer for you Americans. Because like that just seems more likely a more likely way to hurt your foot. Like, you know, if you just like absolutely try to spoon the ball and kicks it wrong, maybe that's what went on. Otherwise, 
Uh, you know, I, I stand corrected if it was American football. Maybe the editor can put a little fact bar in or something to uh, clarify that one for me. Anyway, um, like during this game in Paris, he went to the doctor who removed a jagged piece of nail, bandaged the wound and asked Marley to stay off his feet. This being Bob Marley, that was out of the question since he didn't want to stop the tour. And he certainly didn't want to not go on stage and play his song. So he quite simply just played through the pain, often finishing concerts with his right boot filled completely with blood, which he'd then have to drain after every concert. By June 1978, the European leg of the tour had ended and Bob had traveled to Delaware to spend some time with his mum and get ready for his US shows. However, his toe had still not healed. In fact, it got worse to the point where he could barely walk anymore. He went to a foot specialist who took a biopsy and returned with a dreaded diagnosis cancer. It was a very aggressive form of melanoma that was often fatal, but could be treated if caught early on. Contrary to a popular urban legend, the football injury didn't cause Marley's death. The cancer was already present when the injury took place. After seeking a second opinion, Marley was left with two options. The best was to amputate the toe. This is what his record label wanted since he had a short recovery time and thus meant that Marley could get back to, you know, being on tour and making the money. Never changed record industry, but Marley didn't want to lose his toe. So he went against his doctor's advice and just removed the nail and adjacent flesh while trying to cleanse the wound as much as possible. How is that? How is that what you choose? Like, I've seen Game of Thrones. I've seen the bit with Ramsay Bolton. I, like, and if you haven't seen the bit, like, don't Google it because it's not very nice. But I do at that point, if I was having to scrape my wound that was close to my bone of like, you know, gangrenous infected flesh, I'd just cut, the, I'd just cut it off. But you know, Bob Marley's built different, apparently. At first, it looked like it worked. And two months after the procedure, Bob Marley was given a clean bill of health and he was playing football again. Why? Why would you do that? Why? And he went into the studio and recorded two more albums, Survival, which was absolutely named, and Uprising. In 1980, while on the Uprising tour in New York, Marley collapsed while jogging. He was taken to the hospital where he was basically handed a death sentence. The cancer had spread throughout his body, including his brain. Despite the devastating news, Marley still wanted to perform and he played one final concert in Pittsburgh in September 1980. After that, his health was really too frail to continue to do pretty much anything. When Marley came to the realization that he was dying and there wasn't really anything he could do about it, he wanted to be flown home to Jamaica, but his condition got worse during the flight and had to make an emergency stop in Florida. Bob Marley died in Miami on May 11th, 1981, aged 36, receiving a state funeral in Jamaica 10 days later. The impact he had on music became evident just a few years later when his greatest hits album was released. It's still, to this day, the best-selling reggae album of all time and one of the best-selling albums overall. It's titled, quite fittingly, Legend. And we got there in the end, didn't we, folks? And for anyone wondering who the hell are you, I'm Carl Smallwood. And I used to write for the sister site to Biographics Top 10s many, many years ago. And they asked me to step in as interim host. If, if you don't like it, let us know in the comments and th they'll replace me. But if you did enjoy the video, let us know in the comments below. And uh, thank you for watching and have the day you deserve. I think correctly, it's like it's Rastafarian. They, they worship the jar. Rastafarian religion. God, question mark. Oh, it's a picture of Bob Marley. Oh no, because that's an article about Rastafarianism. Oh, the jar, yeah, they do worship the jar. Just for a second. Wait, do Rastafarians just worship Bob Marley? That would make sense, but come on.